I'm Michelle Ackerley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. But across the UK, there's a chronic shortage of council and housing association homes. I know so many friends and so many people that just literally don't have anywhere to live. Adding to the crisis, some tenants are abusing the system, holding onto properties they no longer need, or even worse, unlawfully subletting them and coining in a small fortune. Subletting social housing is wrong. It's wrong, it's illegal, and it's wrong. So every day we'll be with the housing investigators as they crack down on those rogue tenants. Can you go bear lives? Reclaim properties. Anybody in? and give them to families in genuine need. All of those keys are yours. Oh, don't, because you'll start me off again. This is Council House Crackdown. Our reporter, property expert Luke Doonan, also grew up on a council estate. And for the last six months, he's been working alongside dedicated housing investigators who will stop at nothing to track down every single tenant who's abusing the system. Today, we discover an ex-pop star forging documents in a tenancy fraud spanning nearly 20 years. The occupant has been arrested, is about to be brought down and taken off to a police station. We find out just how intense cracking down on suspected cheats can get. I don't live here. I've shown you right. Yep, where, where, did, where did you start? Can I finish? Can I finish? OK? Conversation's done. I would like to have a look around the flat. Out. And we catch up with a tenant who claims he's living in his council house in Reading, when he's actually in Greece. You wouldn't put your status as living in Greece unless you were living in Greece. That's pretty blatant, isn't yeah. it, to the world? Yeah, absolutely. England is home to 8 million social housing properties. A staggering 20% of these tenancies are thought to be fraudulent. Meanwhile, there are 1.8 million families on the waiting list. From technology to tip-offs, housing investigators have many weapons with which to tackle tenancy fraud. But sometimes the most effective is a surprise door knock. Our first case is an unlawful sublet. The couple who should be living here have been subletting for nine years to their nephew whilst they've been in Portugal. 6 a.m. Battersea, South London, the Springfield estate. Ben Marshall and Alan Emerson are housing investigators from Lambeth Council. They've received a tip-off that two of the properties on the estate may be being unlawfully sublet. So they're heading out before dawn to see if they can catch people at home. Good morning, Lambeth Council. No lights on. No, but I think I think that is his BMW downstairs. Ben's informer also mentioned the car. Good morning. So from the council. Um, Good morning, sir. I'm doing a tenancy audit. I'm after Maria or Jose. Fantastic. Who are you, please? The man who comes to the door yeah, is not the legal tenant, okay. but he agrees to talk to the two investigators. Ben and Alan are invited inside. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. But our cameras are not allowed in. The legal tenants of the property are a middle-aged couple originally from Portugal. The person who answers the door is a young man in his 20s. He tells the investigators he's the nephew of the tenants and he's paying the rent. But he also reveals that he has someone else there paying him rent. I'll write to you and we'll take from there. OK. Cheers, mate. So it seems the official tenants have been gone for a full nine years without ever telling the council. Nine years in which someone on the housing waiting list could have been in the home. We've been into the property. The tenants went abroad nine years ago. And that's what, um, that's what the guys told us as well. He knew the game was up. Was pretty much saying, yeah, I, I know there was a situation. I knew that something like this would happen at some point. And uh, yeah, it's true. It's fair enough. My uncle's been gone for, I think, nine years, pretty much. 
pretty safe to say we'll get the property back. How many families over those nine years could have been housed in that pretty nice flat is, is pretty wrong. Three weeks later, Luke goes to see Ben to see if there's been any developments on this case. So, Ben, tell me what evidence you have on, on this one. Um, well, we looked into the, uh, the guy that was in the property. The tenants are long gone. They've been mm -hmm. gone for nine years. Uh, but he is the legitimate nephew of them. Uh, okay. And so they've left him to use the property. No one's told us. Right. So basically, the original tenant has left, gone elsewhere, yep. and effectively handed over or given the property to their, to their nephew. Absolutely. And he's a, a, a younger guy. And so I did a bit of looking into him. Okay. And I found out that he's a managing director of his own company. Really? Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of company? Have you got anything you could show me? Yeah, well, this is um, it's it's uh, it's a support services company, um, and uh, one of the things that they uh, do is they do, for example, cleaning of uh, pre-tenancies uh, and around the housing market, right. um, and cleaning of communal areas and bits and pieces. So it's you know loosely based in 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 certainly uh, social housing. The other thing is, so he's uh, he's paying the much reduced you know rent of sort of four hundred and. £50 pounds, uh, a month or so, mm. when obviously if he was in the private sector it would be 1300 at least, I'd have thought. Mm. Um, but the thing that makes it even worse, actually, is that uh, it's a two-bed property. He was in one of the rooms, but he was subletting the other bedroom throughout as well, throughout oh, these wow. nine years as well. So I don't know how much money he's made from that, but it'll be very significant. We know a bit about the nephew who's, who's been living in the property. Where are the original tenants? Do you know? Well, they are Portuguese, um, and the long and short of it is that um, nine years ago, they went back to Portugal uh, to live in Portugal. They've got their own home in Portugal, and, and that's simply where they are. They decided then to give the property, effectively give it to their nephew here because he was still in London. They don't have the right to do that, do they? Absolutely not, no. They simply needed to tell the council that they were leaving We'd have got the council property back nine years ago. We'd have turned it around very quickly. Mm. Um, and as I say, some, some homeless family wouldn't be homeless. We're in a very wealthy country. Nobody in this country should be living uh, without a roof over their head. I think the social housing system is very valuable and it's clearly under tremendous pressure and we've seen a lot of examples of that recently and uh, yeah, I, I think it's essential to the future of London that we have a healthy social housing sector. I, I'm an ex-council tenant, I'm now a, a homeowner, but um, it was really good thing to be able to, to, to get into. Simple fact of the matter, like you said, it, it was a stepping stone. Um, I, I couldn't afford to go and privately rent, um, I couldn't afford to go and buy anything, um, but I was lucky enough to get, to get a council flat. So I use it as a stepping stone, and obviously I'm now a, a homeowner. I still live with my parents, because <laughs> I can't afford to, to move out, but I'm grateful and thankful that I have a, a roof over my head. In 2013, the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act came into force, making the unauthorised subletting of council properties by the official tenant a criminal offence. People who are unknowingly renting from the official tenant would not normally be prosecuted. But if the subtenant does know and is in on it, they could be charged under the Fraud Act. The next case is an extraordinary story of an ex-pop star who assumed someone's identity in order to stay in a council property that he wasn't entitled to. The lead investigator on this story is Mike Frost. In the last six years, he's reclaimed 519 social housing homes from people who were misusing them. Today, Luke joins him as he hopes to make it 520. Mike's been uncovering one of the most extraordinary cases he's ever come across. They're on their way to Stockwell in South London to raid on a council property which has been unlawfully sublet for nearly 20 years. We're investigating a case that uh, the, the fraud's gone back roughly 20 years. Wow, tw I mean, 20 years is obviously a massive amount of time. Yeah. The person who's been renting it is an ex-pop star. This is him on a German TV show in 1972. His stage name was Daniel Boone. But his real name is Peter Green. The story starts in 1995, when a man called Frank Zuereb 
moved into a lovely Victorian council property in Albert Square. Not that one. This one's in Lambeth. But two years ago, when a housing officer made a routine visit to the property and was refused access, alarm bells started ringing. Mike began an investigation. He quickly discovered that the man paying the utility bills was a Peter Green. So where was the official tenant, Frank Zureb? Mike's team went back to the address to find out exactly who was living in their property. The man who answered the door said he was Frank Zureb. He actually opened the door for us straight away. Um, was very amenable, but um, was quite adamant that he was Frank Zureb. To prove it, he showed Mike a Freedom bus pass with a photo ID in the name of Frank Zureb. But Mike wasn't convinced he was actually the legal tenant, so he asked him some more questions. We asked him what his date of birth was, and he gave us the wrong date of birth for our tenant. I didn't believe that he was Frank Zureb from that moment. So the investigations team dug deeper. They checked with the police and with the border agencies, and discovered Frank Zureb had left the country in 1996. The man who was actually residing at the flat was ex-pop star Peter Green. He was about to face some tough questions. I'd said to him, well, he was, we're going to do an audit. We has to sign and confirm details and also uh, would take a statement from him. Mm -hmm. And if he lied in that statement, that would be considered fraud. And that's when he held his hands up. He had used his photo with Frank Zureb's name on official documents that he used as ID in order to live in a property he wasn't entitled to. Now Mike's about to join police officers and a bailiff at the property. He's obviously uh, used the property for, misused it for 20 years in our tenant's name. That's a, that's a massive amount of time, isn't it? It's See? huge, yeah. Mike's priority today is to make sure that any evidence at the flat is collected and preserved, and that Peter Green is arrested and taken in for questioning. Hello, Peter. The police explained to Peter Green the reason for his arrest. Sir, it's pretty simple. Over the last couple of years, well, yes. more than a couple of years, you've had in your possession uh, false identity documents with improper, improper intention of using them, i.e. Someone, someone else's identity with your face on certain documents, official documents. For that reason, you're going to be arrested today and take a Brixton police station, OK? Oh. The man who Mike believes has been pretending to be the official tenant for 20 years has been told to get dressed, while Mike and the police search the house for evidence. So, Mike, what's happening at the moment? Um, basically, we're just conducting a search of the property to uh, gather some of the evidence that we've seen previously. Um, he has said to us that he's thrown a lot of it away already. OK. So he's admitted to doing that. Um, but I know that some of the documents used to be in his room. So once the policemen have finished dealing with him there, then we'll search his room after we've searched the rest of the property. OK. What kind of things are you looking for? Um, just looking for the false IDs, mm -hmm. looking for any p potential tenancy agreements, any links where I can see an association between himself and our tenant. He's, he knows our tenant. Uh, he's known them uh, apparently as friends. He communicates with them and sends them Christmas cards. He has their telephone numbers and their addresses. So we'll be looking for an address book as well, okay. with telephone numbers on right. as well. There could be a lot of information you could find yeah. this morning. It seems there's more paperwork in the bedroom. And, and just to clarify, the, the gentleman here that's just been arrested has been effectively um, pretending to be the original tenant for how long now? Uh, over 20 years. Right. Yeah. Massive amount of time. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. A council tax bill only strengthens the case against him. The name of the real tenant is Frank uh, Zuru, mm -hmm. and this council tax bill is in the name of Peter Green. OK which is where he's changed it and chopped and changed it from Peter Green to Zurich and back. OK. When he thought it had been rumbled, as it were, he he's changed, changed it, it back, back to, to into the, the tenant's name. name. That's okay. correct, yeah. With Mike's investigations complete, it won't be long before the property is repossessed. The occupant has been arrested, and I believe he's about to be brought down and taken off to a police station. 
Mike and his team are going to stay upstairs to try and find some more evidence. After 19 years of living there, there's a lot of paperwork up there. So, Mike, what happens next? Okay, from here, we go to the police station. Uh, we will conduct a pace interview. It gives him an opportunity to put his side of the story and obviously, hopefully, clear the matter up for us. Um, hopefully, we'll garner some uh, details of our tenant, make contact with our tenant, because that's the next most important step. Mm -hmm. We'll contact our tenants and hopefully get this property back into circulation. The police questioned Peter Green and the Housing Association got the property back. The flat has now been relet to someone from the housing waiting list. I think it is good if, if councils do investigate. Um, as I say, I think the, the deeper problem needs to be addressed as well, but certainly in the, in the short term. Um, yes, I'm, I'm in favour of councils making sure that what limited supply there is is going to people who need it the most. I just think it's just such a shame that if there is a system there for it to be abused, I think we've probably got to look at the reasons why people are doing that and also how it's allowed to happen. Because obviously for all of those people that are kind of abusing the system and have more than their fair share, there's people who have absolutely nothing. I mean, it's been so cold recently and the number of people homeless on the streets is just heartbreaking. It's not fair, is it? Other people could have that flat. It's just happening a lot, actually, yeah. There are other ways tenants can illegally use their council properties. A 31-year-old Birmingham man conned home seekers out of £2,000 worth of deposits when he advertised his council flat using a classified ad site online. The same man had previously been sentenced to two years in prison for defrauding women he met on dating websites. His council flat advert tricked a single mother of two and a trainee chef out of several hundred pounds each. He was sentenced to two years and eight months in jail. <laughs> Investigators Ben Marshall and Alan Emerson from Lambeth Council are making unannounced visits to the Springfield Housing Estate in South London. Working on information received, they're following up on properties they think might be unlawfully sublet. They've received a tip-off from the police that the people living at this next flat are not the official tenants. Hello, good morning. From the council. Good morning. Good morning. My name's uh, Mr Marshall from the council, my colleague. We're doing a tenancy audit of uh, the property, of the block. Um, I should also say we're being uh, followed by the BBC at the moment, so uh, they're filming at the moment. Is it all right for us all to come in? So we've got, we've got two, two, two ladies as well. Thank you. The lawful tenants of this flat are a middle-aged couple. How long have you been living here? I have lived here. Yeah. So you don't live here. No. Where do you live then? Um, S97. Southwark, is it? Yeah. You're here now. I don't live here. But you don't live here, OK. My, my information is that you do live here. Okay. Um, so that's one thing I would say. Who's, who's your uncle? The man is claiming that he's looking after the flat for his uncle. Mm -hmm. Did you sleep here last night? I, I sat here last night because I was told that my uncle told me that the, the guys are come to change his kitchen and his bathroom. Right, OK. And it's too early for me to come the whole time. So yeah. he's at my aunt's. He said, look, just stay here. And then... So where, where is now? He's at my auntie's. Apart from you, who else stays here? I don't stay here, once again. OK, if you don't stay here, who does stay here? My uncle. Yep. The girls stay here. Anyone else? When they need to. And they live here, do they? Man, you know what? Unless you've got a legal document that says that, because to be honest with you, you're asking questions I don't know how to do. No, that's fine. Well, if you don't, if you don't know, know, you can just, just tell us you don't know. I mean, we're just trying to establish exactly who might be at the property. Obviously, we've come here this morning looking for the tenant. I don't live here. I've shown you where I live. Yep. Where, where, did, where did you can stay I last night? Can I finish? OK? You guys knock the door. I'm assuming it's for the bathroom so that they can come sort it out back on. Rather back to my place and do my thing. Yeah. If that's not what you're here for, and you're not going to call my uncle, conversation's done. Yeah, well, I... I, I conversation can, I can speak done. to him, yeah. Can you? Oh, okay. I would like to have a look around the flat. Out. 
the man refuses to answer any more questions, and he tells Ben and Alan he wants them to leave, so that he can get back to sleep. No worries. Ben and Alan are heading back to the office to dig deeper into exactly who has been using this property, and for how long. Two months later, and inquiries are still ongoing. A series of credit checks have been carried out, revealing that eight different people have been financially associated with the property in recent years. Ben and Alan believe the lawful tenant is no longer living there and are preparing to start the formal process to get the property back. Subletting is obviously wrong and should be cracked down hard. I think people who legally sublet um, their council accommodation should, being that they're, they're breaking the law, whether morally or criminally, I think they deserve to be punished as criminals. And in my view, they should lose their property and pay back all the money they've made. But I suppose they're subletting it to people that still need housing. So that is, I suppose, right, but they shouldn't use it for their own income. The people doing the Ill illegal subletting are doing it fraudulently. They won't pay tax, so that tax isn't going into providing more housing. So everybody is a loser from, from what's happening. Ah, Greece. Sunshine, blue skies, picture postcard scenery. It's no wonder so many of us Brits visit every year. One council tenant liked it so much, he decided to move here. Nothing wrong with that, until you know he's supposed to be living in a social housing property near Reading. The tenant concerned is a martial arts teacher. He'd been a tenant of Housing Association One Housing since the late 1980s. There was nothing remarkable about the tenancy until a few years ago, when housing officers noticed that whenever anything needed doing around the house, it was always the tenant's daughter who contacted them. Luke finds out more. Our tenant's daughter had called on, a, on behalf of her father a couple of times uh, with repairs. If you've got someone's daughter just phoning up, that's quite normal, is it, just to organise repairs or whatever need is needed? It it's not unusual, but it happened uh, on a number of occasions. They hadn't really seen him. They'd gone round to the property. They, they, weren't, they weren't finding the tent. They weren't really seeing him at home. OK. So suspicions at the Housing Association were raised, and then the tenant called Reading Local Authority's Council Tax Department. In April uh, of 2014, our tenant called them up and said, I want to move, I'm moving abroad with my, with my wife, can you put the, our daughter on the council tax? At this point, he's only talking to the local authority, but he's, uh, what he's saying there, he's going to go and live abroad somewhere else, his daughter's going to stay in the property. If you have social housing, you can't just do that, can you? No. I, I think he didn't expect anyone to be looking at this too seriously. Um, maybe he didn't think he was doing anything that wrong by just allowing his daughter to live in the property. It's a common misconception, but normally you cannot pass your social housing onto your children. They have to join the queue with everyone else. Back on the trail, the council contacted the Housing Association investigators and asked them to look into the case. They began their search online. We make great use of, uh, of social media, things uh, of that nature. Uh, people post about their lives. Yeah, sure. So what we did, we did a quick search and we found uh, a profile for our tenant online. OK, what did that tell you? March 2014, saying goodbye to the pets, because uh, he's, he's moving to Greece. Due to our house move, our beautiful pets and cat and the dog uh, are changing household. It's sad to see them both going. He's rehoming his pets. Um, and again, you can see March 2014, right around the time that it's tying in with the information that we already have that he's going to leave. You can see here that it says he's living in Greece. And uh, a picture of the house there. From our point of view, the, the evidence doesn't get too much better than that. I guess you wouldn't, you wouldn't put your status, as I can see it there, living in Greece, unless you were living in Greece. This is a social media site, Facebook, that everyone uses pretty much. So he's putting that out there yeah. to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And he's very detailed about what he posts 
Um, there's a lot of it, so you know, and it's very specific about locations, what he's doing. He tags himself in, so you can see from some of the posts. We'll have a look that uh, he's actually locating himself as being in Greece when he's uh, when he's putting that up and putting that out there. He's putting so much information on. So I mean, in a way, he's giving you on a plate a uh, quite a, be a beautiful life story yeah. in in images, isn't it? Absolutely. Anyone who who can use a computer can access. It's very blatant, isn't it? It is, yeah. With nearly 39 million people in the UK using the internet every single day, tracking someone's life is easier than you might think. From social media and online banking to chat rooms and forums, it's a source of information that councils and housing associations are now actively using to investigate tenancy fraud suspects and put guilty parties behind bars. More evidence came in the form of another status update. So you can see here, in the very same month on this next post, started a new job. OK, I mean, that is just surely all the information you need. The guy has moved. I can see it says moved. I can yeah. see it says started work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, this is almost the, the perfect investigation. We don't really want to have to go and trace money or anything through three, four, five bank accounts. This is all here. It's all been given to us by the tenant, simply putting informa information out there. Uh, for, for the public and for anyone to read. With so much evidence already in the public domain, Graham felt confident his tenant would move his daughter out and give the keys back to the Housing Association. We've had an interview uh, with him and we've essentially put this information to him. We've said that we don't believe that he's living at the address, that his daughter's living at the address and he's out in Greece. Uh, and we've taken him through the, the, the same evidence that we've shown you today. He denied that he was living in Greece. Really? Absolutely. Wow. Uh, what he said to us was that, uh, essentially, you can update your Facebook status from anywhere, uh, and, I, and I just do that. I want my friends to know that I've a nice life, I've got self-confidence issues. So basically, he was saying to us, I, I'm not living there, I'm just making these posts up. Sir Graham was forced to get yet more evidence. We also requested bank statements from him, and uh, one of those was a, a joint account with his wife in Greece. We asked him in the interview, uh, if he had, if he knew about that account, and at first uh, he denied it, denied it flat out. He said to him, "We've got this joint account that's going yeah. to clearly show transactions coming from Greece." Did he try and fight to keep the property? A few days later, he came to the office and said that uh, actually he didn't, he didn't want her to, to have that fight. He said that he was prepared to, to hand the keys back. Finally, this Greek tragedy had come to an end. We have vacant possession, we have the property back, and it's in the process of being relet. OK, and I have no doubt whatsoever that a family who is in genuine need of social housing will be over the moon to live in a house like that. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen before, it's a, it's a lovely property. It's going to go to uh, one of the many deserving people who will make good use of it. London councils own a quarter of all council homes in England but are responsible for over half of all housing fraud detected. 1,618 homes were recovered from cheats in London last year. If you've got something that's worth a lot of money, i.e. somewhere to live in London, it's bound to be open to, you know, people abusing the system. I think the strain in London is particularly difficult. Um, London is a, is a hub for migrants. It's a hub for people who want to work on the black market. Um, and I think, and therefore, as a result of that, you're going to get overcrowding. There are people out there that do need social housing and need it desperately, especially people with bigger families. Um, so in order for other people to actually earn their money off that, which I think is quite, it's not nice really, is it? Who wants to sleep on the streets? Who wants to, you know, um, not have a bed? Who wants to sleep in hostels? As far as I'm concerned, my home is really important to myself. And, you know, if, if it came that I basically no longer needed it, the first thing I would do is give it back to the people that I actually own the place from, you know, and not be selfish about it. Some tenancy fraud cases can be resolved very quickly, but others can take months of painstaking detective work. Viridian Housing is one of the biggest housing associations in the UK. It manages over 16,000 properties. Preventing property fraud is a big priority for them. 
Luke meets up with Katrina Robinson, who heads up Viridian's tenancy fraud operations. Katrina is relentless in her pursuit of tenancy cheats, so much so her efforts were recognised by Her Majesty when she received an MBE in the New Year's Honours list. Katrina, how do you deal with housing fraud here at Viridian? Well, we have two in-house tenancy fraud investigators and we also have an in-house legal team and we are very passionate about detecting and stopping tenancy fraud. Why are you so passionate about this? Because it's simply not right when we have the huge problems we have at the moment and probably will continue in the country regarding housing that people are making vast sums of money out of subletting our properties mm. and they just shouldn't be. Our properties are to house people that have a social housing need. We're not here for people to make a profit out of us. And it is pure greed. People can make an awful lot of money out of it, but of course now they can also go to prison because of it. Do you think a lot of people think, got a social housing property or a council property, it's mine, it's just the council, I can do exactly what I want with it? Yes, unfortunately I feel a lot of people are of that view. They consider it's like, you know, back in the 1970s was when you got a social home, you had it forever and you never got evicted and things are very, very different now. Our next case took Katrina's team over 12 months to unravel and involved a young woman who not only barely set foot inside the property allocated to her, but tried to cling onto it by falsifying documents. This is Redcliffe Square in the Earl's Court area of London. Once known as Bedsitland, it's now an exclusive and sought after area. Luke's on his way there now with housing officer Debbie, who wishes to remain anonymous. In March 2014, Viridian Housing moved a young woman into a flat in Redcliffe Square. A starter tenancy was given to a female single occupier mm -hmm. about March 2014. Um, she was nominated to us because she was in a female hostel. On the face of it, the tenant seemed like a deserving case. But after a few months, the neighbours reported that there was no one living at the flat. Debbie decided to investigate further. You've given someone a tenancy who's in a vulnerable situation, who's been living in a hostel, yeah. and they appear not to not to be there. Well, that's that's what was being alleged right. um, after the first sort of when the referral initially came to me. I conduct uh, background checks. She wasn't showing as laying a footprint. When you say footprint, you mean things like gas, electricity, utilities, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, sort of like showing maybe bank statements. Maybe mm -hmm. you'd move your mobile phone contracts. Was am I right in thinking that we are we are kind of seconds away from Chelsea? Yeah, I mean, this area is the London borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Yes. Incredible. It's just full of incredibly <laughs> tall, beautiful houses. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. If you park here, um, we're going to the property that's literally just over there, on the side of that square. Okay, so it's actually on this square. It is on the square. This yeah. is stunning, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Very impressive entrance, isn't mm, it? Yeah, really nice. Let's go inside and have a look. So, how many flats have been here? Uh, there's eight. Okay. One of the first clues that the tenant wasn't actually living at the property came when her mail started piling up. Obviously, the tenant's mail is put on the hall table here, and it had been reported that there was uncollected mail for the tenant. Okay. Um, which I saw for myself when I visited. Um, there was a, a bundle. Okay. Are you going to show me the flat? Yeah. Great. Let's have a look. What's sort of uh, the layout here? This is the bathroom. Okay. That's nice. Nice high ceilings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what's... And the living room next door. All right. I mean, it's, it's a studio flat. It's a studio flat, yeah. So it's living room and bedroom, uh, and bedroom all in one, but one. It's, yeah. it's still a good size, and t I can't get over the location. Well, for a single person, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Where, where it is, for the amount of money, uh, mm. great. A typical studio flat on the open market in Redcliffe Square would fetch up to £1,500 a month. The Housing Association rent on this property is just £514 a month. Up here, so it's on two levels, yep. this is yep. the kitchen. Going to the kitchen, That's yep. pretty sizeable, isn't it? Well, yes. She had the flat. What happened in terms of her? I spoke with my manager who, sort of given uh, the, the lack of contact, we had na you know, people in the block saying they'd not been seen. The housing officer had made visits, she'd not responded. There was piles of posts being left in the hallway. Mm. We decided to serve 
the notices. Okay. Serving a notice to quit and a notice of seeking possession means the tenant has a set period of time to vacate the property. If they fail to do so, then eviction proceedings will start. So when you say serve notices, that's giving the tenant, your tenant, the opportunity to give the flat back because it's clear they're not, they're not using yeah. it. Yeah. How did she react to that? Well, I served the notice, um, which has two months before it expires, and I literally heard from her about four days before it expired. Really? So for almost two months, I heard nothing, and then she picks the phone up. Yeah. What did she say? She said that she had been away, I had to do with a family emergency, and that this was her main home and that she would prove it to us. I gave her the opportunity to go away and provide me with utility bills, uh, payments made, usage details from the date that she moved in the flat to, to the date that she made contact. So the tenant came up with some emails that seemed to indicate the services were all in hand. I looked at the sort of emails that were being sent and I queried them with the actual companies themselves mm. directly. And the emails had been doctored uh, that she'd been really? sending to me. The tenant faked emails from the utilities company to try and keep hold of the flat that she wasn't even living in. After yeah. she'd rang me in response to the notices and I said, this is what I want, she then got on the phone sure. to all the utilities. Kind of... Um... Kind saying, of, I, you know, I need an account, I need the account in my name, kind of thing. It's kind of um, quite desperate. Yeah. I sort of said to her, basically, I'm fully aware of the, you know, what you've done. You've doctored emails to make it look like you've been resident from the start date mm. and been paying um, bills. When you confronted her with that, was she shocked? Well, this was over the phone. Right. And she, did, she was in denial, complete denial. Surely the whole idea about social housing is that you actually, you actually and live And you live it. there. Yeah, it has to be your main and principal home. In fact, leaving the flat empty is a breach of the tenancy agreement and it's preventing someone in need from living in it. After a whole year of battling it out at court, eventually the Housing Association won back possession of the flat and the tenant was ordered to leave. This is now clearly a home to someone. Yeah. Uh, so you got the property back and it's been relet to someone else? Yeah, within weeks of um, getting the property back, we've got, um, the new tenants moved in, made it their home. But that yeah. must give you amazing job satisfaction yeah. to know that someone in genuine need now lives where we're standing. Well, all I can say is congratulations with your tenacity. <laughs> great, great, great work. Well done. Thank you. You don't just walk through the door and say, can I have a property, please, and they're handing out keys. To be issued that and then not use it, I w can't understand why people would do that. The victims of social housing fraud for me would be the people that genuinely have a need for uh, either immediate social housing, so people that maybe need to have been moved into a uh, from a hostel or maybe from a bedsit to somewhere that's more permanent if they're a young family and they're not having that availability because somebody else is exploiting the system. It's so valuable, uh, this housing, that uh, we should be very disciplined about how it's used and councils should be very careful about what they do. I think that far too many social houses homes were sold off in the past which has left a desperate shortage now. And I, and I know people who are on waiting lists, so um, I do think it's a problem. This next story came to light when a housing benefit claim was made from an address which should have been rented out to another family entirely. In fact, the family who should have been living at the flat in Poplar East London had moved out and were unlawfully subletting it. This is Avril Drummond from Poplar Harker Housing Association. She's passionate about social housing going to the right people. In other words, the people who've been waiting patiently on the housing list, rather than wanting to jump the queue. She first got wind of this case when a colleague examined a housing benefit claim from a resident in one of Poplar Harker's homes. This case first came to light. Um, I received an email from the rent officer to advise me that a housing benefit claim had been made by somebody who wasn't our lawful tenant. So I started looking into the circumstances. I carried out financial checks on the person named on the housing benefit application form and also on our lawful tenant. And I found that our lawful tenant, although we're still registered on the property, uh, the electoral roll, so was another three different people, um, which concerned me greatly, as it was only a two-bedroom flat, it's not a huge property. 
So I started carrying out financial checks on the uh, lawful tenant and that showed that she did have a few financial links to the property, but so did the person who was named on the housing benefit form. Normally, you wouldn't register your bank account um, or credit cards or apply for credit um, at a property you don't live at as your main and principal home. So Avril dug further into the tenant's paperwork. I checked back on the tenancy. There was no notification that this tenant had other people living in the property with her. Um, and she was still registered there with her husband and two children. So the property would have been extremely overcrowded with eight people living in, the pro in a two-bedroom flat. If you're a social housing tenant, you're supposed to inform the council if you get married or have children, or if there's any change in the number of people living in your property. Once Avril was sure of her case, she went to the flat and spoke to one of the people living there. It turned out to be a friend of the tenant. Once we were inside the property, the tenant's friend who'd been living there for years, she was very helpful, very cooperative. Um, she gave us some, you know, more information and more evidence. The documents the subtenant gave to Avril showed she was paying £350 a month in rent to the official tenant. With other names also associated with the property, Avril decided she had sufficient evidence to start the formal process of getting the flat back and allocating it to someone else. We believe that the property was being possibly misused for up to four years, putting everything together, the financial evidence, the evidence, the witness statement from the uh, tenant's friend, her bank statements, um, also with the pictures of the um, inside the property, that in whole gave us, we believe, enough evidence to warrant serving notices on the property, which is what we then did. Once Avril had told the official tenant how much evidence she had, the tenant didn't take up the option to go to court, but handed the keys back. The property has been reallocated to a, a local family in genuine need of the waiting list was absolutely fantastic. You know, every single family that's rehomed, you know, is a job well done as far as I'm concerned. So absolutely over the moon that a deserving family has now been rehoused. It really is down to the hard work and tenacity of housing fraud officers that tenancy cheats are being stopped in their tracks, and those properties can then be given to people in genuine need.